Fear of the truth. I am amazed at the number of people who cling to false doctrine these days simply because they are terrified of what they read in the Bible. They take things to be literal, such as the writings of the book of Revelation or other things in the Bible. They never delve into the languages and learn the manners of speech, the metaphors, the symbolisms, types and examples which would help to dispel their fears. Because once many of these things are understood as to how they're actually written and what is actually being said, that they are not literals, but examples or prophetical metaphors, then that removes the fear of the events that they read of. However, there are those that refuse to look into the Hebrew of the Old Testament or the Greek of the New Testament and learn the manners of speech and how the ancients related a thought one to another in their own languages. I have recently been out doing some teaching locally with people that I have known for years and have talked to for years, planted seeds with. And it is amazing to me that you can talk to someone for months or years or even decades about the truths of the Bible and then the very next time you see them they're back to the same old beliefs they were in in the first place because they sit down and watch the TV preachers and just about every TV preacher out there on all of these Christian networks speaks of the rapturing away of the church being caught up and some of them have even put it to me that well God has always taken his children to safety before any big destruction or any big event. And to that I say, that's only partially true. One example given to me was Noah. Another was Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, let's examine those for a minute. Was Noah taken up? No. Noah was forewarned of the coming flood by our father. He was not taken up. He was forewarned to prepare for it. And it took him probably years to build that ark and to gather all those animals together. And Lot, was Lot taken up even though there were angels present with him? No. He was forewarned of our father and told to leave Sodom. He was not taken up. He was not. The, Noah and Lot were not raptured away. Were they taken to safety? Yes, it can be argued that they were taken to safety, but how? Because they were told ahead of time of what's coming, which is exactly what our Father's Word does for us today. And we'll cover some uh, scriptures later with better examples of our Father's protection rather than us flying away. You know, we're told to gird up with the gospel armor. Well, you don't put armor on to run away. You put armor on to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. The really sad part about this is most of the reason that these people are afraid is that they have been taught that God is hateful and spiteful and unmerciful. And when I say that, I have to uh, qualify it. I mean, they know of salvation through Christ. But to them, there is no middle ground. In other words, you're, you're either going to be a saint or you're going to fry in hell. And a lot of them believe that their, their ancestors or their grandparents or friends who have passed on who weren't exactly right with the Lord, maybe, uh, are burning in hell right now, and that's not the case. But they're taught that God is to be feared, as though he were a genocidal obsessed maniac, rather 
than our living, loving Father who loved us so much that he came down here and sacrificed himself in the personage of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, and who has always forewarned us of what is coming. We're going to begin this Bible study with a prayer. We're going to cover a good little bit of ground here, but uh, be turning, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah chapter 38. This is going to have particular relevance because it's going to concern King Zedekiah and what King Zedekiah was told to do, and then we're going to cover what King Zedekiah did rather than what he was told to do and what the outcome of it was. But before we begin this Bible study, let us go before our Father and let us ask for guidance and wisdom as we study these His most holy scriptures. So let us pray. Our glorious Father, who art in heaven, we come before you this day, Father, to ask that you lead us and guide us to the light of the truth. We ask, Father, that you open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths. We ask that your hands always be upon these studies, Father, to guide us. And that your word prevails as your plan will, Father, in the minds of the listeners who may be first listening to this, that they may understand the truth and not be afraid of those things that are coming, because you will stand with us, Father, and you will fight our battles as you did the children of Israel. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahushua HaMashiach, Amen. So, the book of Jeremiah 38, uh, chapter 38, we're going to read here of what happens whenever a prophet prophesies the truth to a people. And this happens even to this very day. So, Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 1. Then Shephatiah the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malachiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto the people, saying, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city, now what city are we talking about here? Jerusalem. Okay, what are we told to do in Mark 13 and Matthew 24? To get out of the city. But he that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword and the famine and the pestilence. Shades of Revelation. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans, that's your Babylonians, remember what Babel means. It means confusion. He that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live. For he shall have his life for a prey and shall live. In other words, you're going to go into captivity. It was God's plan for these people to go into captivity, just as surely as it's God's plan for us to go into captivity in the end times to one world government and to Satan the Antichrist. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army. Now, if you relate this to our time, prophetical, it means the locust army of Satan, who is the king of Babylon of the end times. To continue with the verse, which shall take it. No question of it. He's going to take the city. <clears throat> now, we're talking about the exact same place here. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Christ left from. It is where he shall return to. But it's also where Satan, the Antichrist, the king of Babylon of the end times, is going to appear claiming to be Christ, standing where he ought not, as it's written in the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and 9. Or book of Daniel, chapters 8 and 9. Verse 4. Therefore the princes said unto the king, we beseech thee, let this man be put to death. 
In other words, we don't like the truth that this man is speaking. Let's have him put to death. Shades of your scribes and Pharisees, your Kenites, the sons of Cain, who can't stand the truth. Also kind of reminiscent of a certain female who's now running for president and anyone who digs up any dirt on her seems to just, uh, oh, I don't know, die of natural causes, quote unquote. But these men don't like it that Jeremiah is prophesying the truth. And they say, let this man be put to death for he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city. In other words, we, we're not going to we're not going to go into captivity. We're going to fight against the game of Babylon. Well, in doing so, you're going against God's plan. In the end times, we're not going to fight against the king of Babylon, Satan the Antichrist. We're going to be delivered up, and God is going to speak through us. He shall do battle for us. But these men are all upset. They're the princes, the rulers of the city. No doubt some of them even priests. They want this man, Jeremiah, to be put to death because he's weakening the hands of the men of war, the fighters, the warriors of the city, and the hands of all the people in speaking such words to them. In other words, in telling them the truth, he's weakening them. You know, that's one of Satan's favorite things to do is to tell you that the truth will weaken you. And that's what a lot of people in this country now believe. That's why we have so much perversion going on, so much crime in the streets, so much unrest, as they call it, when it's really riotous mob behavior. And these men are continuing, for this man seeketh not the welfare of the people, but the hurt. And you know, it's so funny that welfare is used there in that sentence. I think God has one heck of a sense of humor, because that's exactly what they tell you today. That's what politicians tell you today anytime someone talks about cutting welfare benefits. This man's not concerned with the welfare of the people. He wants to take away your goodies. Like always, people do not want to hear the truth. They want to hear smooth, sweet words that pander to them. They want free gifts. They want to be entitled because, oh, how bad they have suffered in this land of the free. I mean, we've even got a San Francisco 49er football player who won't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance because he says the flag of the United States is oppressive. And, of course, he says these things while he's making $114 million a year playing football and lives in a mansion. You know, this, this great land of opportunity that's been so good to him is so oppressive. Poor little baby. Don't you just want to change his widow diaper? Verse 5. Then Zedekiah, the king, said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. In other words, I'm not going to stand against you. You're my princes, you're my priests, you're my advisors, so he's in your hand. I'm not going to stand against you. Verse 6. Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison, and they let down Jeremiah with cords. In other words, this, this is a deep pit. And in the dungeon, there was no water but mire. In other words, mud. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. In other words, he, he probably sank right up to his chest in, in filthy mud and sewage and everything else that was in this prison. Verse 7. Now when Abimelech the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. The king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, verse 8, Abimelech went forth to the king's house and spake unto the king, saying, verse 9, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. And he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Verse 10. Then the king commanded Abimelech, or Edibimelech, interesting name, servant of God, servant of the just, the Ethiopian, saying, 
Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. Verse 11. So Edabimelech took the men with him, and went into the house of the king, under the treasury, in other words, this place is hidden away, and took thence old cast clouts of old rotten rags, and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. Verse 12. And Abimelech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts of rotten rags under thine armholes and under uh, the cords. In other words, put them under your arms. And Jeremiah did so. Verse 13. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Verse 14. And Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him in the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing. Hide nothing from me. In other words, I want to know the truth. This is, this is a wise move by Zedekiah. Only he's not going to believe it and he's not going to follow it. Verse 15. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, unto Zedekiah, if I declare it unto thee, wilt thou surely put me to death? If I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? Verse 16. So Zedekiah the king swear secretly. Very important word in this sentence. Secretly. In other words, I don't want my princes and my priests to know about this. So he swore to him secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that has made us this soul. I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hands of these men that seek thy life. Now, Zedekiah will do this. Verse 17. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shall live and thine house. In other words, all your children. Verse 18. But if thou will not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the king of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hands. So there were two paths to take here. You can serve the king of Babylon and stay in your home. And that's what Zedekiah was. He no longer had his kingdom power, but he would have retained, kind of like the royals have in Britain, the office, and he would have saved his life and preserved his children's lives. But old Zedekiah is not going to do this. Uh, let's do verse 18 again. But if thou will not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, in other words, to, to, to uh, obey them, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, which is, again, the Babylonians, and they shall burn it with fire. Remember your book of Revelation, uh, the uh, locust army that comes breathing fire and brimstone. Again, a metaphor, not literal. And thou shalt not escape out of their hand. In other words, you can either live and serve the king of Babylon, or you're going to die if you don't. Verse 19. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. In other words, he's more worried about the Jews and the Chaldeans that he might be delivered into their hands, and they're going to mock him than he is to obey the word of God. Verse 20. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee. In other words, seriously. Obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. And so it shall be well unto thee. And thy soul shall live. Verse 21. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord hath showed me. Verse 22. 
And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on, and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. In other words, you're, you're useless. You've been stopped. You're not going to be able to fight. How can you fight when your feet are in the mire? You know, the French learned a very valuable lesson about that uh, at the Battle of uh, Azincourt. Verse 23. So they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hands, but thou shalt be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon. That's by the power of the king of Babylon, spiritually speaking. And thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. Not only burned, but pillaged, looted, and left a wreckage. And that is exactly what did happen. Verse 24. Then Zedekiah said unto Jeremiah, or then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, or thou shalt die. Verse 25. But if the prince is here that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee, and say unto thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said to the king. Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. Verse 26. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. In other words, back to the prison pit. Verse 27. Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all the words that the king had commanded him. In other words, Jeremiah did not betray the king's trust in him. So they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. In other words, they didn't catch on to it. It went right over their heads. Verse 28. So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. Don't ever forget the word taken, especially in the New Testament. When it says two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Because it doesn't mean that the one taken is taken up in the clouds. It means they're taken in deception. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. Of course, we know this from uh, the writings. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 39. Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. This again is a type of Satan, the Antichrist, coming with all his locust army and besieging Jerusalem as well. Verse 2. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up, destroyed, looted. Verse 3. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal Sherezer, Sam Garnabo, Sarsicum, Rabsaris, Nergal Sherezer, they've got this twice, obviously two different people with the same name. Rabmag with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. Verse 4. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah the king of Judah saw them and all the men of war, that they fled. They took flight, in other words. Remember Ezekiel 13. I hate those which teach my children to fly to save their souls. Okay? I have taught this a number of times. It doesn't mean to fly away necessarily, although that is a good analogy for it, but it means to take flight, to run away. And went forth out of the gate or out of the city by night. In other words, I think they're going to sneak out by night, Zedekiah and his uh, group here. By way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls. And he went out the way of the plain. 
In other words, he, he he's running, running as hard as he can. Verse 5. But the Chaldeans army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. Another place where a terrible event happened, where the walls fell. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah, in the land of Hamath. Another interesting word there, Hamath. For those of you who know of the children of Hamath. Where he gave judgment upon him. Verse 6. And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. All the royalty. Slew them all. Verse 7. Moreover he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. Now there is a much deeper type here for those of you who can see it. He put out his eyes. He took away his eyes to see with. And he bound him with chains, like many are bound with fall doctrines, and carried him away to Babylon. Babylon meaning confusion, where people are confused about things like whether there's going to be a rapture or not. They don't know whether there's a false Christ or not. Or they believe if they do know about the false Christ, the Antichrist, they think he's coming after. Christ has come and taken the church. But that is not what is written in our Father's Word. And if you don't know that, why don't you know it? You know, that's the thing that really burns me up about Christians, is so many people say, yes, I'm a spirit-filled, Jesus-loving Christian, but they don't even know the chronological order of events written of in our Father's Word. In Mark 13 and Matthew 24, it gives it to you clearly, the events. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells you clearly the events. The book of Revelation tells you the events. The fifth trump, the sixth trump, the seventh and final trump, which is the day of the Lord. Yet people still think that Christ is going to come back and take his church. But what really gets me is who do they think is uh, are the people that are going to prophesy against the false one? Let us continue with this chapter, verse 8. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house, in other words, made it a desolation, and the houses of the people with fire, and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Verse 9. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away, that fell to him and the rest of the people that remained. In other words, he was given charge over them. This will be the man, quite frankly, uh, Nebuzaradan, who releases Jeremiah and the two daughters of Zedekiah, who still lived, that would go on to Egypt and then finally would go on, uh, from what we know of history, to Ireland and form the king line of Terah, which still sits upon the throne to this very day. A lot of people try to say that Queen Elizabeth is a Kenite. That is an absolute untruth. And they say, well, she's worthless, so she's got to be a Kenite. Uh, no, there are many kings in the Bible uh, of the line of Judah that are worthless. Go, go read the book of Chronicles or First and Second Kings sometimes and look at all the evil kings of the bloodline of the kings of Judah that were real Jews. They were not Kenites. Look at all the evil they did in setting up houses of worship, bringing putrid uh, false gods into the house of the Lord. Grove worship and uh, their high places that they made to worship the uh, gods of the land. Baal and uh, Tammuz and Chemosh and Ashtaroth and all these things. Verse 10. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left off the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah. In other words, left them behind and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. In other words, they've destroyed uh, Jerusalem now, but it would be unprofitable to take these poor people and have to feed them in Babylon. So why not leave them here and give them uh, places to plant vineyards 
so that this can become profitable. These are people that did not run. They are people that submitted themselves to the king of Babylon. You see the type here? That's what you are to do whenever you are delivered up. You don't fight against Satan in that way. You fight against Satan by allowing God to speak through you with the Holy Spirit. That is your defense. That is how you are kept from the day of Jacob's trouble and the hour of temptation. Verse 11. Now Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, verse 12, Take him and look well to him, and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. In other words, uh, Jeremiah no doubt submitted himself to the king of Babylon, and much like Daniel, he found favor in the eyes of the king of Babylon. Verse 13. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent Nebuchadnezzar, or Shashban, excuse me, Rabsaris, and Nergalshazzar, Rabmag, and all the king of Babylon's princes, verse 14, even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home so that it, he dwelt amongst the people. Now, as we know from the book of Revelation, Jeremiah would be released and would go back. And he would, again, take the two daughters of Zedekiah and he would leave the land of uh, Israel the land of Judea and go to Egypt and then uh, again form that king line which still sits on the throne to this very day of the seed royal. Uh, verse 15 Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison saying verse 16 Go and speak to Edebimelech the Ethiopian saying Thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel Behold I will bring my words upon this city for evil, and not for good, and they shall be accomplished in that day before thee. Okay, now here in that day means that uh, Edabimelech is going to live to see it. But remember what Edabimelech means. It means the servant of the king, the servant of the just. Um, in other words, it's a word that goes right along with being in the service of God, the true king. And we see in that day used here. Well, in that day, wherever you see it in the Bible, usually is referring to the day of the Lord. Spiritually, that is the message that you're to take away from this. Because all these things are going to happen before you in that day. Verse 17. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord. And thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men who thou art afraid, of whom thou art afraid. Now, this man is an Ethiopian. And, of course, there is land association here, but this man is also probably a eunuch being that close to the king. So, therefore, he probably is a real bona fide Ethiopian. That is to say, a black man. And um, he's being told here, you're going to be delivered in that day. What is that a type to us of? Well, there will be kings and queens of the ethnos that are amongst the elect, and they're going to be delivered too. Why? Because they believe in the words that God say to them. Verse 18. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword. But thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. You know, the word sword here is a very interesting thing. It goes right along with Revelation 1.16. <clears throat> it's the two-edged tongue of Christ. In other words, the word of God. Now, a lot of people use the word of God in this day and age, that is to say the Bible, to slay people. Well, how do you use the Bible to slay people? Well, you teach falsehoods from it. You go by the English-only translation, brother, and you tell people that, yes, we're going to fly away. We got nothing to worry about. It's going to be an easy trip. 
nice smooth swelling words to make people just so happy and warm and cozy inside and not prepared for what they have to face that is to say the tribulation but we're going to get to that now let us turn over to the new testament to the book of matthew book of matthew chapter 10 and verse 1 and this will be christ of course this as you know, the Gospels are Christ's life, and we're talking about Christ here, verse 10, or excuse me, verse 1 of chapter 10. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, okay, that, that tells you who it is, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. Now that is a promise that still holds true to this day. If you are a disciple in Christ, which means if you are a disciplined one in Christ, you can cast out unclean spirits. They have to obey you. There is no if, and, or but. It's not like in the movie Exorcist where the thing just keeps clinging on and hanging on no matter how many enchantments you throw at it or how many times you say, The power of Christ compels thee! When you tell one of these things to get out, they go. You cast them out of this earth age. Send them back to where they came from. It's a death sentence from them. And pretty soon when they see your power, they will steer clear of you. But he gives them power to cast out unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, there's a spiritual connotation to this. When a soul does not know the truth, what is it? It is sick. It is diseased. Diseased with what? False doctrines. You see, there's a metaphoric amount of speech even in this. Now, in the book of James, we are told to anoint and lay hands on and pray for people. And if God so wills it, they will be healed after the same manner as these disciples are being given power here. So this still does happen today. But see the underlying message here. You can cast out unclean spirits. You know, churches are full of unclean spirits today. That's where they do their best work. And you can heal all manner of sickness and disease. You can feed people with the truth. Feed, give them the living water which is pure and the bread of life which makes them whole. Verse 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, or Petra, the rock. Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee. And John, his brother. Verse 3, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Verse 4, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas, Judas Iscariot, or Judas Iscaroth, who also betrayed him. Now, this is written before uh, actually, it's written after, but in the timeline that we're talking about here, where the story is, this is before he would actually betray. But these things were no doubt written down after the fact. Verse 5. These twelve sent Jesus forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles. Now, the word Gentile here, as I've explained I don't know how many hundreds of times or how many thousands of times is a word usually that means a person who is not of the tribe of Israel in some facet or form. But it also means one that is unlearned of God's word. And that's what moreover is being said here. Now, were they sent to the lost sheep of the children of the house of Israel? Yes. But you have to think about what timeline we're talking about here. You've got to separate the metaphoric from the literal timeline, but you need to understand both. And into any city of the Samaritans enter not. Why? Well, the Samaritans were Gentiles. They're not Samarians, they're Samaritans. They're the people that came into the land of Samaria after the ten northern tribes had departed. Verse 6, But go rather to the lost sheep of the children of the, or the, uh, of the house of Israel. Now, did that say the house of Judah? No, it said the house of Israel. 
Now, that does mean the house of Judah included in that because you've got 12 tribes, but he's sending them forth to the house of Israel. And we know that um, from certain historical writings that Peter and Paul both, and not only that, it is recorded in the Bible that uh, uh, Paul went to Europe. In other words, he went to Rome. And the lost chapter of Acts uh, 29, which most people, including myself, believe is authentic, speaks of Paul going to Britain. But regardless of what you feel about that, he's told to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, remember again what Israel means. It means the prince who has power with God. The prince that prevailed with God. He that has power with God. Okay? And without God, he doesn't have power. It's talking about the faithful. You don't have power with God if you're not of the faith. Christ said, no man cometh to the Father by me. If you're not of the faith, you don't have power with God. That doesn't mean you can't be a good person. It doesn't even mean that you're doomed to hell yet. Because we do have the millennium. Praise God. God is not going to let any soul go that is worth any good. God will not let a soul go to hell in ignorance. I know some people preach that, but that is not going to happen. The people that go to hell are basically going to choose to go to hell or will have done evil to such extent that there will be no other alternative, but we must let God judge that. Verse 7. And as you go, in other words, as you go to the house of the children of Israel, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is the kingdom of heaven at hand? Christ has come. Verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now remember what I told you about the metaphor. Heal the sick. Okay, yes, they will be healing the sick, literally. They will be cleansing lepers. They will be raising the dead. They will be casting out devils. But what does this mean to us today? Do we raise the dead? No. No one today can raise the dead. I'm sorry. You know, I don't care what you believe, no church on this earth raises anyone from the dead. There may be people who... God has decided it's not time for them to come home yet, who are clinically dead, who uh, awaken, and things like that are, are well heard of now. But you don't take a dead body that's been in the ground for two or three days or whatever, like was done with Lazarus, and raise it from the dead. And no church can do that today. So they were allowed to do it in their times as a literal to show the people the miracle power that they had of the living God. But what does it mean to us? It means heal the sick. How do you heal the sick? Well, you make them well. You give them the truth. You cleanse the lepers. You get rid of the sores off their souls. You raise the dead, the, the, the spiritually dead, by, by feeding them with the truth. You cast out devils. You get rid of those demon lies and those familiar spirits which are babbling in your churches. And freely you have received and freely give. In other words, don't charge for it. Now, there's nothing wrong with a pastor making a salary or anything like that because, after all, that is their job. And a servant is worthy of his hire. But for people like myself and many others that I know, I have had people say, let, let me send you a love offering or let me send you a, a tithe. Well, I don't really have any way to use the tithe. Um, if you're going to tithe, I, I would suggest sending it somewhere like the Shepherd's Chapel or to somewhere you know is a Bible teaching establishment church or teacher who can use the money. Verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. In other words, the workman's worthy of his hire. 
In other words, you're going to go and you're going to work and you will be provided for. You know, Paul uh, was a uh, tent maker. Peter was a tanner. You know, they also worked. They not, they not only, uh, you know, Paul and Peter and all these great apostles didn't spend uh, 16, 18 hours a day just preaching the word of God. They also worked as they went across these places. You know, they didn't live off of anybody. They weren't part of the welfare state and entitled. They got out and worked their butts off and weren't, weren't a burden to anyone. Verse 11. And into whatever city or town ye shall enter, inquire in it who is worthy, and there abide until ye go thence. In other words, go and find who is a worthy brother and stay with him and stay there until you leave. Verse 12. And when you come into an house, salute it. In other words, bless it. Salute it. Salute everyone there. A salutation. Verse 13. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come into it. And if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. Verse 14. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of of that house or city shake off the dust of your feet good lesson for those of you who plant seeds today you know how many people do you say you know there's there's not going to be a rapture like most believe and they look at you crazy or do you know that there is an antichrist that comes before the true christ and that they're like uh uh what did you say and some people will say you're wrong well, what do you do? Do you argue with them? No, that doesn't get you anywhere. You shake the dust off your feet. In other words, walk on and shake the dust off your feet. Get the degradation off of you that you picked up there. Verse 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why? Because Christ has come. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have Christ. Verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents. Okay? What are the serpents that we're talking here on the spiritual level? Okay. Well, the Kenites. Be as wise as the Kenites. Be smarter than them. How can you do that? You have to be aware of them. Now, being aware of them and preaching that everyone is a Kenite is not the same thing. You know, uh, there are Kenites that are well able to come to our Father. Everyone is able to come to our Father if they so will it. But be wise as them and be harmless as doves. In other words, do no harm. You've got to be like the gentle cooing of a dove when you spread our Father's word. Verse 17. But beware of men. In other words, beware of men. Man is a fickle thing. For they will deliver you up to the councils. And they will scourge you in their synagogues. And of course, this goes right along with Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21, which we're going to be going to when we're delivered up. The same thing happened to our predecessors who taught the truth as will happen to us. Only to us it will be slightly different. Verse 18. And when you are brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles, again, the unlearned, in this case, it would probably be the people of the lands round about who were Gentiles. However, to our time, spiritually it means the unlearned. Verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Okay? You ought to see Mark 13 and Matthew 24 written all over this. And Luke 21. It's not you that's going to do the speaking. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Ruach. Verse 20. For it is not ye that speak, 
but the spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Now that's what's going to happen when you are delivered up before the Antichrist. And when you are delivered up to the churches and the holy uh, religious community because you don't believe in the false Christ, that they don't know is the false Christ because they think he's the real one because they're not studied of our Father's word properly. Verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. In other words, blood is not as thick as religion, brother. And it sure ain't as thick when you think you got Jesus standing before you, only he ain't Jesus. And the father of the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Again, who is death? Who is it that has the power of death? Hebrews 2.14. You're going to be delivered up to death, which is to say, Satan, Antichrist, the killer of souls, basically. Spiritual death of souls. Now, does he kill any souls? Literally, no. God is the only one that can destroy a soul. But he can cause them to be deceived. And he can cause them to falter. And if they follow him, then yes, they are going to perish. Verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, did that say that he that endures till the rapture is going to be saved? No. It says he that endures to the end shall be saved. The end of what? The end of this earth age. Or in this case, the end of their lives. And they did. Verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Okay, so that gives you right there kind of a timeline. Till the Son of Man be come. Okay, well, this is written after the Son of Man has come in the flesh, so that can only be pointing to one other time that he comes. Verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. Verse 25. It is enough for the disciple to be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If you recall, Christ was a servant. He got down and washed his disciples' feet. God washed his disciples' feet. Do you understand the love there? If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? In other words, people are going to be saying, you're a devil worshiper. You're one of Satan's own because you do not worship this man standing in Jerusalem saying he's Christ, which they will believe is Christ. And you know, I've been called a number of things over the year. I've been, I have been told that I am filled with Beelzebub. I have been told that I'm a Kenite. I have been told that I'm many things, you know, by, uh, by, by some of these really, really biblically trained people. Okay? So, uh, their opinion's worth about uh, 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 a piece of dirt out there on the ground to me. You know, if I could help them, it would be one thing. But no, most of the time, it resorts to name-calling. You disagree with them, they call you names. You're a servant of the devil. You're an evil white devil. You're filled with Satan. You're filled with the spirit of Beelzebub. And nothing has changed. You know, just like Solomon wrote, that which has been shall be again. Verse 26. Now, this is one of the reasons I came here, because we're talking about the fear of the truth. Okay? It, this is going to be your time to do your dirty. Or your duty. This is going to be your time to do your duty. It is going to be dirty, quite frankly. Because you're going to have to step in and amongst the trash to, uh, to rescue souls. But what does God say here? Fear them not, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. In other words, there's nothing hidden. It's going to be made known. When's it going to be made known? On the day of the Lord. 
And it's also going to be made known when you speak forth in that glorious Holy Spirit tongue. That cloven tongue. Because it's written, even the gainsayers are going to be convinced. When they hear God speaking through you, it's going to be undeniable. Verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And that's the way it should be. Now, not literally. You don't have to go stand on top of your house and start yelling, The Satan is coming who's going to be the Antichrist and there's not going to be a rapture. I mean, you do that, pretty much people are going to think you're a fool. It simply means spread the message. In the old days, when you sounded the trumpet upon the housetop to warn that an enemy was coming, it alerted people. So that's what this means. It means what I have told you, what you have heard with your ears, not only literally, but with your ears to hear, preach that on the housetops. In other words, sound the alarm. Verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him which is able <clears throat> to destroy both body and soul in hell. Okay? Now, if you doubt who the destroyer of souls is as far as literally who kills the soul, it's written right here for you. God is the final judge, and he is the consuming fire. And hell is the place where that happens. Has it happened yet? No. There are not people currently burning in hell, despite what some ignorant preachers tell you. That does not happen until the great white throne judgment, as it is written in the book of Revelation, long about chapter 20, or 21. But, that time is not yet. Verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father? In other words, without your father knowing about it? In other words, they were a pretty precious bird. To be sold to for a farthing. Uh, I mean as far as to be able to eat. Uh, I'm guessing this is a pretty inexpensive meal. When it really comes down to it. But. Um, what this means is. Despite that they're inexpensive. Not one of them is going to fall to the ground. Without your father knowing about it. Verse 30. But the very hairs of your head. Are all numbered. In other words. God knows how many hairs each of us have on our head. Do you understand that? Now, if God has that kind of knowledge of you, to know how many hairs you have on your head, th there's not one of you out there who knows how many hairs you have on your head. And your barber doesn't know how many hairs on your head. And I doubt very seriously, if he were to count them, that he could get it exactly right. But God knows... So that's how precious you are to God. God is not something to be feared such as the word fear means. It means to be reverenced. Now, should you fear God? Uh, well, well, yeah, because he's God and he can. But he doesn't want you to be scared of him. That's why he's given you the truth. You're precious to him. You know, have you ever sat down and watched these videos on YouTube or any of the other places where soldiers return home from war or being deployed overseas and their children haven't seen them in a year or more and they go into a classroom where their children are at and the children get up and in tears break down and, and, and run to their fathers and put their arms around them. Now, the children don't care that they're crying in front of the other children. Because the emotion of love overcomes them. And the spirit of their love overcomes them. Now, I know many of you parents have probably dropped your kids off at school and gave them a hug. And they go, oh, mom, you're going to embarrass me. You know, that, that's a different matter. But when you haven't seen your dad or your mom in the army uh, for a long time and you're reunited that is a wonderful warm feeling and it's hard to watch those 
uh, kinds of videos without tears welling up in your eyes. And that's how God is with us. You know, if you're in good standing with God, and maybe even some of the pitiful souls that, that God takes pity on, he wants, when he returns, to wrap his arms around you and say, good job, my faithful servant, well done. And it's going to be that kind of reuniting. Tears of joy. And when I say tears of joy, I mean metaphorically speaking. There will be no tears in heaven except for the wailing and gnashing of teeth that people do because they've been deceived. When the tribes of the earth mourn, when they ask for the mountains to fall on them. But let's get back to where we were here. You're worth more than a sparrow. And a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without God's knowledge. And God knows the numbers of your head. They're all numbered. Verse 31. Therefore, or excuse me, fear ye not therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Why? Because you're God's children. Now, God loves his animals too. Don't get me wrong. And he loves the sparrows. He loves all of his animals or he wouldn't have created them. And I don't think he takes a very friendly eye to people that abuse animals. But he loves you more because you are his child, his beloved child. He loved you so much that he came down here and he did not have to let them nail him to a cross. And he could have come down off that cross and saved himself any time, but he didn't. He suffered it for you. Never forget that. Verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. You know, a lot of people love to use this to guilt you into posting something on your timeline or uh, in some other manner. They don't use it to its correct value. I mean, of course, if you're a, a Christian and you believe on Christ and you're studying of the word, you're going to be professing it to others. But what's going to happen when you're delivered up before men? Well, you're going to confess before them. That Holy Spirit's going to speak through you, unless you deny it. And if you deny it, that's unforgivable. And Christ is going to deny you before his Father which is in heaven. That's the only unforgivable sin written of. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Okay, now when it says men here, uh, this is speaking moreover of the flesh age, but it also has to do with the spiritual, because when we enter that spiritual realm, there are going to be some that perish and go to hell, and we know that, because it's written that some will not make salvation, and they're going to deny Christ before men. Only at that time it will be spiritual men. But whether in the flesh, here, which is temporal, or in the celestial, the spiritual body, the effect is the same. Christ will deny you before his Father, which is in heaven. Verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. You know what sword he's talking about? You should. Revelation 1.16. He's going to be wielding that sword. If you drop the S off that word, you got it. It's the word of God. He came to bring the word. And it is a sword that cuts both ways. It can yield a harvest or it can cut to the quick. Verse 35. For I am come to set man at variance against his father. And daughter against her mother. And the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Why would Christ come to do that? That doesn't sound very Christ-like. That doesn't sound all honey dripping and sweet. Because he's separating the chaff from the wheat. If you don't fall and worship what most people believe is Jesus, which will actually be Satan the Antichrist, it's going to tear households apart. You know, we fought the Civil War, I shouldn't say we, I wasn't alive, but uh, 
This nation fought a civil war, brother against brother, over their beliefs, and over taxation, and over tariff, and eventually, at the, towards the end, slavery. But it tore entire households apart. Same thing's going to happen when you don't fall and worship the false Christ that everyone else believes and perceives to be Christ. They're going to be at variance with you. And even now people are at variance when you talk to them about the rapture. When you tell them that there is no rapture, so to speak, no pre-tribulation rapture, that is to say, and no mid-tribulation rapture, but we all gather back to Christ at the seventh trump, oh boy, you can cause entire families to get in an uproar over that. And and guess what? You, you ain't going to be invited to Sunday dinner again, trust me. So get all the gravy you can while you're there. Especially if it's Aunt May's signature brand. But, uh, you know, Christ came to separate the chaff from the wheat, verse 36. And a man's foes shall that be they of his own household. You know what a foe is? That's an enemy. That's an opposer. A man's foe shall be they of his own household. In other words, we're all taught that God is more important than family, which is the truth. But if people don't know that the one standing before them is Satan and not Christ, they're going to fall and worship him, and it's going to tear entire households apart. And even the truth of the rapture, telling people about it, that there is not going to be a pre-tribulation rapture, tears households apart. Anytime you speak a truth from the Word of God, which is a real truth, a bona fide truth, a truth which can be documented, especially in the languages, it's going to have negative effects with somebody, whether it's a cousin, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, an ant. So you're being warned of it ahead of time. Verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's Christ telling you that. Do you understand that? You cannot love any member of your family more than you love Christ. Verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. In other words, we're lucky that we're not going to have to do this. But there have been people who have been nailed to cross for the name of Christ. Would you be willing to do that for Jesus? Would you be willing to do that for our Father? I'll tell you this, you had better well be. You're lucky that that's not going to happen because that's not what's written. But even if some of it did occur, you better be willing to have it done. You must love our Father that much. Because he did it for you. Verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You know, this is a, this is a, a particularly special verse to me. Because many years ago, and I've said this in my testimony, before I really knew the word of God, I did drugs and I smoked pot, and I did things which were not exactly holy. They weren't the worst things that people can do, but they weren't good either. They were very fleshly. And one night I was struck down. And over these many years, about 30 or so, I have suffered because of that. Because... I do miss living life. I do miss the things which might have been, which I see other people living and taking for granted the wonderful things that life has to offer. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that so long as you love the Lord. Nor would it have been wrong for me. But I developed anxiety attacks which stole 30 years of my life. And I have constantly battled with keeping this one verse in mind. 
I was chosen to some purpose which God gave me. I didn't choose it. My choice was to go off and do stupid things. And I'm not saying I'm a prophet or anything wonderful. I'm a fallible human being. And I am a sinner. Even now, with all the knowledge that God has blessed me with, with all the wisdom that God has blessed me with, I am a sinner. And I do lament the loss of my life. But I also realize that this verse is very important. And perhaps many of you out there of the election or with ears to hear have the same trouble when you can't relate to people of the world or you feel that you're suffering. And yes, at times you're going to feel like you're suffering unjustly. You're going to feel picked on. You're going to feel like nothing that you do works out. You're going to feel hopeless. I myself have gotten to the point of such hopelessness at times, even after getting into our Father's Word, that I actually just wanted to die. But then I read a verse like this and other places in the Bible and realize that God doesn't do anything without a purpose. And that helps me find my way back. And tomorrow I may de be depressed again. It happens because we're not perfect. We tend to cling on to the things of this flesh life because it's all we know while we're here. And not necessarily all of them are bad. Now, you know, if you work for your living and you become rich, that doesn't make you evil. If you enjoy going out and going on a cruise or riding a motorcycle through the mountains or seeing the fall leaves or snow or climbing down the Grand Canyon or whatever it is in your life, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Enjoying the beauty that God put here to see. So don't go get on a guilt trip and, and don't feel like you know you have to commit every moment of your life to God in every way possible and shut yourself away from the world and live like a hermit because that's what I did and it has not been healthy for me as far as uh, my mental faculties. It has caused a lot of depression. But, and the only reason I'm saying this, I don't know why I got off on this, is maybe some of you out there need it. You know, there's always somebody worse off than us, and it's hard to keep that in mind. Because while I have suffered with not being able to go and do the things that I would have normally like to do I have led a nice life I've never wanted for a meal I have never been treated badly uh, by my family I've got a very strong family in the word and um, well when I was a child perhaps there were things that happened but um, you know you've got to grow past certain things you know, there, there's, uh, I saw a lot of things as a child that probably people should not see. But uh, it, it didn't destroy me. It didn't, you know, leave any big marks on me, at least that I can recall. And I don't, people say you repress memories. I don't know. But um, I think the message I'm trying to convey here is anytime you think you've got it bad, remember the people that are born with spina bifida or that are born without arms or legs, or uh, even if they're in a horrible accident and they're disfigured in one way or another, or someone who loses a family member that they're very close to, a wife or a husband or a mother or a brother, which we all do, but we don't do it every day. So count your blessings when you have your loving family and when you have the blessings of God and you're not hungry like people in other parts of the world. You know, God is loving towards us, but God is also very strict on us, especially those he's closest to. So always keep that in mind and don't do like I have done and feel sorry for yourself and, and get on guilt trips for things that you do. Because I have felt sorry for myself many times during my life. And it has been to my detriment. 
because I felt life was purposeless and colorless. And sometimes even now I feel that way. Because there's so much evil out there in the world. There's so much uncleanness, uncleanliness out there in the world. So much perverseness. And you almost feel like you're from another planet. And all you really want to do is be happy and have peace of mind. Well, in our Father's Word, you can have that peace of mind. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get your feet dirty once in a while. So, maybe somebody out there needed that. I don't know. But let's get back to our Father's Word. Chapter, uh, or verse 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me. He that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Okay, so, he that receives you receives Christ. And he that receives Christ receives God that sent Christ, is what that means. Verse 41. He that receiveth the prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. He that receiveth the righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Verse 42. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of water only, just, just a cup of water. In the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Do you realize that you can do something as simply as smile at someone that's having a rough time or comfort someone with some reassuring words or give them a cold glass of water on a hot day and that is a good work? You know, God gives us so many opportunities to do good works. And people will get out and complain and put the microscope on themselves and say, Oh, I have suffered. My people have suffered. We deserve reparations. We deserve to be elevated above the rest of you. Because five generations ago, one of our ancestors suffered or Three or four generations of our ancestors have suffered from five generations to nine generations ago. And people will get out and destroy towns and cause traffic backups. And they'll stand on the American flag and do a lot worse. And then profess themselves to be holy. You know, that's what really burns me up, is they don't even realize what they're doing. They can't even see what they're doing. Those aren't the actions. Did, did Jesus ever stop traffic? Did Jesus ever pull somebody out of a car and beat them up? Did Jesus ever kill anybody? Well, Jesus certainly marched into the temple and overthrew the money chambers tables. Yeah, that's right. Because they were defiling the house of God. But he didn't do it because people were beating up Jews, which he was one of. Some people really need to get their priorities in order. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 2. We're not going to read the entire chapter. We're only going to read a few verses which are pertinent to this. We're going to talk about the church of Smyrna for a minute here. Revelation chapter 2. And verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. In other words, Jesus Christ. Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 9. I know thy works and thy tribulation, your troubles, and even the tribulation that you're going to go through including the real tribulation, and poverty. I know that you're not rich, but thou art rich. In other words, you're rich spiritually. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, a lot of people mistake this verse here and say, everybody that claims to be a Jew or where's a yarmulke, is a Kenite. That is untrue. Being a Jew does not make you a Kenite. Being a Kenite 
makes you a Kenite, not being a Jew. These people simply call themselves by the name of Jews. This does not mean that every Jew in the state of Israel is a Kenite, or every Jew in the United States or any other place where there are Jews are Kenites. We're talking about a specific group here, which are the synagogue of Satan, even the children of Satan. But not all Jews are Kenites. And there are a number of ways that you can prove that. First of all, the ground will not produce for a Kenite. There are Jews in this country who own farms. And not only do they own farms, but they grow what's in the farms. And there are Jews in Israel that have vineyards. And they don't hire Palestinians. And they don't hire Arabs or Lebanese or any other people. They hire other Jews. And those Jews are able to bring forth from the earth. There are good and bad figs, but the good and bad fig were planted back in that land. So they are still there. And just because a Jew may not be a Christian may only mean that they have never heard the truth. That does not make them of the bloodline of Cain. It just means that they don't know the truth. You would probably have to know some Jews to ever figure this out. And luckily I do. And they haven't pulled the wool over my eyes. I know very good people who are Jews. And they almost really want to believe in Christ, but they are so scared of the truth, which is the subject of this Bible study. They're scared of it because all they have been taught all of their lives is Torah and Talmud. Tanakh, you know? And you have to remember that, you know, when they train an elephant, and I use this analogy a lot, I realize, but when they've got a baby elephant, they put a chain and chain him to a cement pole. And that baby elephant will try to get away, and he will struggle and struggle and struggle and even rub blisters on his leg from that chain and the uh, uh, cuff around his leg. But he will finally, over a period, his spirit will be broken and he will realize that he will not get away from that pole. So that later on, as adult elephants, which are trained to carry people around in India or Africa, where, wherever you go, where there are elephants and they use them in this manner, they can simply take a mop handle and hammer it down into the ground and walk the elephant up next to it and wrap a rope around his leg. Or a tree. A tree which the elephant could easily pull down or a rope which he could easily break. But that elephant will not even attempt to escape because he learned as a young elephant that he was not able to escape. And the same thing is applicable to the Jews who believe only in the Law of Moses and in the Torah, the Tanakh, in the Talmud, they have been trained by the synagogue of Satan to believe what they believe. But that does not make them of the bloodline of Cain. And I don't care who tells you that that is true, it is not true. Being a Jew does not make you a Kenite. Now, there are other Jews who have lost their identity, who have migrated uh, amongst their brother tribes. Another way to prove this is there were a lot of Jews killed in Germany. Some say six million, some say more, some say less. Depends on what your values of the Jew are. But what sense does it make for Kenites to kill off Kenites? Well, it doesn't make any. But we gain another lesson from that. The Jews that did not accept Christ perished. And they perished on work farms. Or were killed with Zyklon B gas. Or were worked to death. Or were starved to death. In other words, they perished by famine. 
and pestilence and being worked to death. That ought to tell you right there that not all Jews are Kenites. The Kenites are the ones that killed them off. And the Kenites were pretending to be something they were not, even at that time. And they weren't pretending to be Jews. Think about that. Verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Okay, that says it in a nutshell. You don't have to fear. If God stands with you, you don't have anything to fear. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, put on trial, tried by fire, testing your metal, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Okay, that's how long you're going to have tribulation. Ten days. And that's not ten days as in the book of Daniel for ten years. That's ten days of the five-month period. Or whatever you want to say the period is. Be thou faithful unto death. Now, that don't mean be faithful to Satan. It means be faithful unto your death. Now, when you leave this flesh body, your flesh dies. Okay, so don't get that confused with they're going to put you to death. But even if they were to put you to death, be faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death, which is the death of the soul in perdition's flames in hellfire, the lake of fire. Now, I told you we were going to go to Luke. We're going to go to Luke 21. We're going to cover the same ground as Mark 13 and Matthew 24. It's been a while since I've probably covered Luke 21. So this will be a nice, fresh uh, reading of it. Luke 21 and verse 1. This will be Christ again. And he looked up and saw rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. Verse 2. And he saw also certain poor widow, a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. Verse 3. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. Why? Because she had the least, and she gave everything she had. Verse 4. For all these, in other words, the rich men, have of their abundance cast into the offerings of God. In other words, they, they, they've cast in because they had plenty to give. And they got plenty more at home. But she of her penury, which mean, penury is a word that means poor, hath cast in all the living that she had. In other words, she gave up everything that she had to live on to God. And a lot, of, a lot of super preachers try to make you feel that way. Well, God says give until it hurts. And then, of course, they go off to their $300 million mansion with the three tennis courts, the two private golf courses, the, their own lakes, and uh, five swimming pools. That sounds real godly, don't it? Especially when you consider back to the disciples who were neither to take purse, nor script, nor stave, nor two coats, nor shoes. Verse 5, And as some spake in the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, in other words, look at, look at these wonderful buildings. Verse 6, As for these things which you behold, in other words, as for these wonderful adornments which you're looking at, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now that hasn't happened yet fully. The Western Wall is still there. So we're talking about a specific time here. We're talking about the return of Christ when it's finally going to be thrown down. And not only that, they've rebuilt there. And there's some that want to rebuild the third temple there. I got news for them. They may build one, but it ain't going to be the third temple. It may be the third in line, but it won't be the Millennium Temple. Verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be? And 
what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? Now, if you know Matthew 24, you know it says, what shall be, what shall, uh, be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And that's exactly what they're asking him here. Verse 8. And he said, Take heed and be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. In other words, they're going to be professing he's Christ. We serve the living Lord that was sacrificed on Calvary. They're going to be saying that. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Why? Because they're false teachers. Not in the fact that they're saying that he's Christ, but that they're teaching you to fall and worship another Christ by the any moment rapture, by the uh, pre-tribulation rapture, by not teaching when the Antichrist actually comes according to the trumps of the book of Revelation. Verse 9. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. In other words, it's not yet. Verse 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. You know, you could even put the racial divide in with this. And the wars that are going on between Islam and the rest of the world. Verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. Man, we are sure seeing that. And famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Blood moons. I mean, there are famines and pestilences, but guess what? Have you read the book of Revelation? You read the book of Amos? Remember what we read earlier about famines and pestilences? I mean... That's what we're referring to here. Not just famines to do with your tummy tums. It's famine for the word of God. And the pestilences that come from that. Because of a locust army that's eating up all the truth. Verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. In other words, but before all these means most importantly, they shall lay their hands and and persecute you and deliver you up to synagogues and into prisons bring bought for bring brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake in other words you're going to give testimony for Christ verse 13 and it shall turn to you for a testimony verse 14 settle it therefore not in your hearts excuse me I read that wrong settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. In other words, don't even think about what you're going to answer them when they deliver you up. I know many of you do. I have too. But remain silent as a lamb until God is ready to speak through you. Verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom. In other words, the Holy Spirit, which all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. They're not going to be able to speak back to you, brother and sisters. <laughs> and ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you they shall cause to be put to death. Now again, we're talking about death here, Satan. But even if it came down to it, okay, even if we're all mistaken about the meaning of death here, even if they do put you to death, so what? You're going to the Father just a little bit early. Because this whole tribulation is only five months long. What's five months? Oh darn, I didn't give the li to live for the last five months. What I'm saying here is be prepared to take up your cross and die as Christ did. Now, that's not probably going to happen. But be prepared for it if it should needs be. Verse 17. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now, why would all men hate you for his name's sake? Well, it's because of a secular world. No, this world will never be secular. That's probably what the deadly wound is going to be about. It's because secular one world government tries to take it over. But secularism is not going to work 
It's not going to work with Jews. It's not going to certainly not going to work with the radicals of Islam, and it sure ain't going to work with real Christians. Verse 18. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Not one of those hairs that God has numbered is going to perish. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that you're probably not really going to die, don't it? It means you're probably going to live right to the end of this earth age and meet the Lord in the air as he comes here to set up his kingdom. Verse 19. In your patience possess ye your souls. In other words, be patient and endure till the end. Verse 20. For when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, okay? In the old days, we had the king of Babylon compassing Jerusalem with his army. Well, guess what? In the end times, we're going to have the king of Babylon compassing Jerusalem with his locust army. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the world. Not only that, even Jerusalem's even encompassed by armies now. Even occupied by them uh, uh, to, to some extent. And I speak of the Kenites. They are in power over there. Now, I said that every Jew was not a Kenite. But the Kenites are in power over there. You can trust in that. They're in power all around the world. Verse 21. And let them which, in be, uh, which are in Judea flee to the mountains. In other words, we, you know, we read that earlier. Get out of the city. Flee to the mountains. You don't want to be in that flood of lies. And let them which are in the midst depart out. And let them that are in the countries enter uh, not... It, uh, let them... All right, let's try it again. I'm going to need a mouth adjustment here. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. In other words, don't go flocking to Jerusalem. Now, when you're delivered up, if you're taken to Jerusalem, fine, go. But don't go flocking to Jerusalem to be around the false Christ. Flee from it. Why? Because you could be taken in. You don't realize what a sheep-like mentality humanity is. I mean, for God's sake, when you've got Hillary Clinton running for president, what does that say of our people? They're sheep. They're stupid sheep. Verse 22. For these days, or excuse me, for these be the days of vengeance, and all things which are written may be fulfilled. In other words, when you see that happening, you're getting to the days where all's going to be fulfilled. And when I say getting to it, I don't mean just knocking at the door. I mean stepping across the threshold. Because that is the time when Christ is going to come. Verse 23. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Isaiah 54. More are the children of the uh, desolate than the, the married wife. What does that mean? I'm going to give you a quick analogy here. It's like if your husband went off to war for two years and came home and you're sitting there with a just-born baby. That means you have not been faithful. The analogy is that the false Christ, the false husband has come and you have jumped into bed with him. That's where the whole idea of mystery Babylon the harlot comes from. She plays the harlot. She doesn't wait on her true husband. To continue with the verse, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Why? Because they should know better. It's written in our Father's word. Verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Remember that sword we talked about earlier? Which is the word? And shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. The unlearned. You know, that's happening even now. Just like I got through telling you. The, the Kenites, as a matter of fact, are Gentilic. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, until their job is done here and the true Christ returns. Verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, and the sea with the waves roaring. 
You know, I, I could point to the tsunamis that have come upon this nation, or not this world. I should say this world, not this nation. But, uh, you know, really we're talking about the sea of people here of the book of Revelation. Why are they going to be war? Why are they going to be roaring? Because they're in confusion. They're in perplexity. They don't know. Verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Fear of what? Fear of the truth. And fear of what's going to happen to them when Christ is returning. That they pray for the mountains to fall on them and cover them from the wrath of the Lamb. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Verse 27. Okay. Now I want you to realize where we're at here. In timeline, Matthew 24 helps you a little bit better with it. But it's given you here the tribulation. We've just, that's what we've been speaking about. Verse 27. And then, when, when, and then, after that, shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. In other words, after the tribulation. Verse 28. And when these things begin to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Your Redeemer draweth nigh. Verse 29. And he spake to them, Behold, or he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Verse 30. When they now shoot forth, and ye see, in other words, when you see it shoot forth, and know of your own self that summer is nigh at hand. And you would have to understand the parable of the fig tree. That is to say that in 1948, Israel became a nation again. The fig is symbolic of Israel, and it's symbolic of that which is hidden. Adam and Eve, when they did the sin in the garden with Satan, covered their private parts with fig leaves to try to hide their sin from God. But the fig is also symbolic of the righteous fig. There are good good figs and bad figs. Jeremiah chapter 24. When you see the good fig and the bad fig come together again and form a nation, you know that summer is at nigh. What is summer? It's the harvest. What is the harvest of this earth age? It's the return of Christ, but only after the false Christ. Verse 31. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, you know that the kingdom is nigh at hand. Verily I say, verse 32, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Now, he's not talking to the people that lived at that time because they have all passed away. He's talking to you today. And that is the power of our Father's word to bring forth these things. Now, I'm going to stop right there and we're going to complete this study with Daniel. We're going to go back to the book of Daniel in chapter 3. We're going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we're going to understand that you have nothing to fear. Okay? This should solidify to you that you have nothing to fear. Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score, that's 60 cubits, and the breadth thereof, six cubits. That's 60 and 6. 666, type of 666. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Confusion. Modern day Iraq. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. In other words, it's a big gold statue to himself. A big image that he's going to give life to. Much like in the book of Revelation. Verse 3. Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers and the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces came together unto the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, 
And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 4. Then an herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. Type of the one world system there, in case you're missing it. Verse 5. That at the time you hear the sound of the cornet, one, the flute, two, the harp, or harp, three, the sackbut, four, the psaltery, five, the dulcimer, six, and all kinds of music. In other words, when all these things play together, that you fall down and worship the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Okay, so what do we have here to us spiritually? Well, we've got a false image which is going to be Satan himself proclaiming to be Christ, which is very connected to the 60 cubits and the 6 cubits and the 6 instruments being played here. Okay? 666. Six, six. The false Christ number is 666. Six, six. Quite frankly, 6 trump, 6 sail, 6 vial of the book of Revelation to help you out. But he wants them to fall down and worship this image of the beast. Well, where do we read of that image of the beast? Revelation. I keep telling you. Verse 6. And whoso falleth not down and worship, worshipeth, shall the same hour, and I see the hour of temptation, be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. In other words, you're going to go to hell if you don't fall and worship him. Don't you see? Now, that's what the type is to us. People are going to be telling you, Jesus Christ is here, or lo, he is there. Go worship him, or you're going to burn in hell. Verse 7. Therefore at that time, when all people heard the sound of the cornet, one, the flute, two, the harp, three, the sackbut, four, the psaltery, five, and all kinds of music. Now, why is one skipped here? Well, because this is not literally 666. This is just a type of it. Either that or it's a clerical error, but I tend to think of it as this is not 666. This is a type of it. And all the people and the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans, which is to say Babylonians of Babylon, came near and accused the Jews. And of course, these will be the Jews of the captivity. Verse uh, 9. And spake and said unto King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. This was a standard greeting, and you better say something nice to the king because he can cut your head off or torture you to death. Verse 10. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, one, the flute, two, the harp, three, the sackbut, four, the psaltery, five, the dulcimer, six. See, there's six again. And all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Verse 11. And whoso shall not fall down and worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery, fir fiery furnace. Verse 12. There are certain of the Jews who thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought uh, then they brought them before the king. Uh, I may have read that a little wrong. He, he commanded them to be brought before him. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not serve my gods? Now, I want you to notice that in both cases here, where it says my gods, it's lowercase g. That means it's not the god of the children of Israel. It's God's plural. It's handmade gods made by Babylonians, which is kind of what the rapture doctrine is, made by people of confusion. 
Is it true that you do not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Verse 15. Now if you be ready that at the time when you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sax, but the psaltery, and the dulcimer, there's six again, and all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well. In other words, it's going to go well with you. But if not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God, uppercase G, that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now see, Satan thinks that he's not going to be overthrown by God. But he will be. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, Nebuchadnezzar, or said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, they know his power and his authority, but they're not even being careful to answer him. They're going to stand up for what they believe in. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. Verse 17. If it be so, our God, uppercase G, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, lowercase g, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had really had respect for these before. Because like Daniel, and they were Daniel's friends, uh, no doubt they had endeared themselves to him. But now he's mad at them. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. In other words, he really wants to terrify them. Ooh, scary. Going to get that furnace so hot? You know, personally, uh, the hotter the furnace was, if they were going to die, they would be, they would die much quicker. But to the mind of a human being, it's much more terrifying, you know. Verse 20. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, the most mighty men of his locust army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the fiery furnace. Now, you know, there are going to be two witnesses die written in the book of Revelation chapter 11. And this is a type of that. Only the two witnesses will die out of the flesh. Verse 21. And these men were bound in their coats and their hosen and their hats and... Uh, their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace was exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, when they opened that door to drop them into it, uh, it burned the men alive that were throwing them into it. And that's also kind of alluded to in the two witnesses uh, if you know what I'm talking about. And in this manner, they should be killed, ring any bells. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Verse 24. And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the burning of the, or into the midst of the fire? And they answered him and said, True, O king. Or they answered unto the king and said, True, O king. Verse 25. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God, uppercase G, uppercase S. You know what? You can't hurt ministers of fire. Because God's fire doesn't hurt them. And what is the message here? Did they fear? No. Did they cling on to false doctrines? No. Did they bow to the popular thing because they were afraid of tribulation? 
and horse, blood up the horses' bridles and all those horrible, horrible things written in the book of Revelation? No, they didn't. They didn't fear anything. Now, when, when I'm saying that, obviously they didn't know the book of Revelation. I'm speaking to you today who do know of it. And I'm letting you know that God's word, even from this old book of the Old Testament, speaks to you today. Okay? That's, that's what I'm trying to point out to you. But there's a fourth one in there that's likened unto the Son of God. My, my. The Holy Spirit protecting them from that fire. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, uppercase G, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Verse 27. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the kings and the counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. You know, hell fire has no power over your body unless God wills it. And if you're in the truth, God's not going to will it. Nor was a hair of their head singed. There's that hair analogy again. Not one hair of your head shall be uh, harmed. Neither were their coats changed. In other words, they weren't burnt nor the smell of fire passed on. They didn't even smell like smoke. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God, uppercase G, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, sent, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word. You know, no king of the Medes or the Persians or Babylon, once they gave an order, could it ever be changed. And God changed his word. In other words, if he ordered them dead, they have to die, no matter what. Even the king could not say, even the king could not stop and reprieve a death sentence once he signed it. That's how powerful his words were. But God changed his word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god, lowercase g, except their own god, uppercase g. Verse, 24, uh, verse 29. Therefore I make a decree, this is Nebuchadnezzar, that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. In other words, destroyed. And their house shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God, uppercase G, that can deliver her after this sort. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was not an ignorant man. He, he was at times in his life. But, you know, he wrote the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, which is a beautiful prayer. He was converted. Satan will not be converted. But Nebuchadnezzar was a servant of God. Verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. In other words, he put them over the affairs. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the end of this earth age when Christ comes. He's going to set his elect over the affairs of the millennium with him in charge. And they're going to eat the marriage supper of the Lamb. And they're going to dwell with our Father forever. Think about that. So you have nothing to fear. And especially don't fear your Father in that way. Reverence Him and fear what can be done by Him, but don't fear Him. He wants you to love Him. He doesn't want you to be afraid of Him like He was an abusive parent. He wants you to love Him. What a marvelous God we serve. At any rate, that's where I'm going to cut this off. I'm going to say, as I usually do, my beautiful brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you all. And it is my prayer for you that you will get into our Father's Word as much as you possibly can and use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. The E.W. Bulliger Companion Bible. The Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, 
get into your Father's Word and first and foremost pray to our Father and ask for that gift of guidance and wisdom in understanding His Word. And never forget to pray for those that walk in darkness, brothers and sisters, because they are the ones that need it the most. May God bless you and light your path. Thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.